everybody, and welcome to COVID Classical, a playlist for our challenging times. Each week, I'll be curating a playlist of the most beautiful classical music ever written that deals with the emotions that we'll feel during this crisis. Last week, the emotion was hope, and this week, the emotion is humour. My name is Dane Lamb, and I am Principal Conductor and Artistic Director of the Xi'an Symphony Orchestra in China. When I'm not doing that, I conduct orchestras and at opera companies all around the world. Not at the moment, of course, but while we're here in isolation, it's the perfect chance to curate these playlists for you. Now, humour and laughter and levity and jollity is something that we can all use in some of the direst times in our lives. And it's something that we can really use right now. I mean, the ability to laugh does so many things that the science also suggests for our body. It releases endorphins, all those happy energies and hormones running around our body. It can help boost the immune system, which is a huge thing at the moment during this COVID crisis. It can bring us closer to our fellow humans. It can help us look at the world in a new way. And classical music is no stranger to humour at all. Now you might think, oh, but isn't classical music very serious? Well, it can be serious sometimes. But as you'll see, the seriousness always must be offset by the humanity, by the uplifting qualities of humour and fun. And you might ask, well, how can music be funny? Certainly, oh, if there's words and lyrics, and some kind of dramatic scenario on a stage, well, the humour is a bit more obvious, like, say, in a comic opera by Mozart or by Rossini. But what about music where there's no words? A keyboard sonata or a symphony for an orchestra? Well, composers have been having fun with music for years. Sometimes they're sort of nerdy in-jokes, but geekiness is cool right now and it's funny. There could be composers poking fun, at each other by emulating maybe the traits and compositional characteristics and musical characteristics of their rivals. Mozart was great at this. This most ephemeral and ethereal of all composers was merciless when it came to some of his rivals, really taking the mickey out of what they were doing. There can be high wit and there can be low wit. There can be really good old-fashioned wholesome humour and there can be really dark, almost black humour sometimes. But whatever it is, we'll experience it in this playlist, COVID Classical, Week 2, Humour. This week on COVID Classical, we thought we'd try something a little bit different to last week. Your feedback was fantastic after the first playlist on Hope, and so we've decided to try it. You still get your Spotify playlist down below in the description of the video, but I've decided to try to make a YouTube playlist so that everything is going to run on. You'll have this first expository video talking about the concept and also having a chat with a friend, and then you'll get the playlist. There'll be some of the best videos on YouTube, interspersed by introductions by me. Another change to the format this week is that I had the chance to invite a great friend and a musical luminary to come and join me to discuss what it means to have humour in music. Now, this guy is one of the funniest people I know in the business. He is one of the greatest tenors of his generation and is moving further and further into the heroic tenor stuff of Wagner. He is one of the leading proponents of the music of Janacek, which at first glance doesn't seem to be the funnest lightest, most humorous music in the world. But you'll see that this wonderful man brings so much levity and so much humanity and love to everything that he does, on stage and off stage. And so it was my great pleasure to have a little chat over Zoom, of course, in this isolation period, to the Scottish tenor, Nicky Spence. Uh, yeah, so it's a playlist that deals with the different emotions that we feel during this crisis. So we did Hope last week. And then I thought it's it's great to get some, some other musicians to share their perspective on each emotion. And this week it's humour. Excellent. I can't possibly think why you asked me. 
<laughs> How have you been dealing with this crisis? Have there been any practices that you put in place? Has music played a part? I've mainly been drinking, if I'm honest, and um, binge watching programs on television. But since my creative juice has now depleted and I've got over what feels like a grief process when you look at you know, six months of projects which have just kind of dribbled away and the amount of work you put in, especially if you're learning bloody Czech and opera, opera roles and Russian roles, you put so much work into it, it's just kind of gone. So you need to kind of get through that and that's fine. I think you've just got to be fine with that. But ever since I've been kind of taking it like a working holiday and every day has different emotions in terms of you know, anxiety, etc. But in general, I found really good stuff to do, uh, like gardening, baking, hanging out with my love, and going running, Dane. I've been running. Now, let's talk a little bit about the start of your musical journey. You're Scottish, obviously, and the, the Scots bring a great deal of humour to everyday life, I would say, like us Aussies. Um, yeah. So how did you become an opera singer? Well, exactly. I mean, Scottish people, I think, are just generally quite funny. I think they have, like, funny bones. And so, yes, I started singing when I was very young. I was just generally a very noisy child and an actual kind of attention seeker because I had quite a hard upbringing, I guess, and I think through that just wanted to have some attention. So I used to sing and do little shows, and often my mum would kind of shoved me out to sing for cafes and stuff so we could get some food. And, and so you started to find solace and consolation and humour in music very early on? Oh, definitely. And I used to do lots of Scottish songs um, on my granny's knee. Uh, poor granny. I was like what 11 sort of songs? by the time I was eight. Um, <laughs> I used to sing like Ye Banks and Braves or Bonnie Doon. I still sing, actually. I still sing all these lovely Scottish songs. And I used to do some musical theatre and pop music. I wanted to be Michael Ball for about six months. Like, not be a musical theatre singer, but just be Michael Ball. I just thought he was the best thing ever. Um, <laughs> and yes, opinions change. And, uh, but, you know, I still think he's great at what he does. <laughs> and so I have since, uh, then I started having singing lessons when I was about 16 and saw life beyond the jazz hands, although the jazz hands are never far away. And so then I got basically, had a love affair with classical music and went to Guildhall, thought I'll give it a go to see what it's like. And I loved it and that was it. I used to do lots of Mozart and that kind of thing. I really enjoy it. Then I had a vocal kind of crisis when I was about three years into college because I was with a bit of a dodgy teacher and I had to get put back together again and I had a record contract and, you know, I was on tour with Shirley Bassey. And that's enough to make your, you know, your, your vocal cords hemorrhage by themselves. <laughs> How was it working with Shirley Bassey? Oh, she was awesome. I mean, that's a singer. Is she a funny lass? She's lovely. She is quite funny. She, did, she said to me once, you know, the, the, oldest, the oldest berries have the sweetest juice, sweetie. <laughs> so she yeah. found humour, at least in the process of music. Oh, I think you have to if you're Shirley Bassey. I think life's quite fun if you're Shirley Bassey. But well, you um, have to find some humour in everything, right? I mean, how has humour informed music for you? Well, I guess there. I come from a quite an energetic point of view. If I'm going into a rehearsal process, then I'll always have lots of love and energy and positivity in terms of the collaborative process, which is putting on an opera. And I think that's really important. And I think the actual gift of comedy can often diffuse a situation which can get a bit heated within opera, as you know, as a conductor, I'm sure you've Oh, absolutely. That. Yeah, those situations. So, so even if you're not performing a comic opera, a comedy as it were, we can still find humour in, in, in the rehearsal situations because you've gone from this, these sort of Mozart roles into... Uh, so-called heavier stuff like Janacek and 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 also Wagner. I mean, this is is it can be quite dark and heavy stuff. At least that's how it's perceived. Do you find any lightness, any levity, any humour in that music? 
I think you have to. You have to find something which is rounded, because I don't think anybody's ever truly evil or bad. Everybody is com something and there's something else. From personal life experience, I've discovered that shitty people can do great stuff and angelic people can do shitty things as well. So I think those are the most interesting operas. And I think when you dig and start to build up layers of a character, then you do find that these people are real people. And that's what I find interesting about them. And often there is comedy, even if it's dark, even between Fricka and Votan, for example, in the ring, that kind of marital relationship they have is quite interesting. There's dark humor there. And there's lots of, you know, darkness and humor to be found in all of the, the operas that I find interesting. In terms of comedy, I see myself as quite, you know, a funny person, if not just to look at. I, um, yeah, had to struggle with that early in my career because it would have been really obvious for me to go down and do lots of comedy roles. But actually getting into the Anacek where there's, you know, like dead babies involved and murders and rape, rapers and all the rest of it actually made, has made my career a lot more interesting because I haven't been put into that comedy role at all, really, which is great. Yes. So I might just do that until the end of my career when I'm, you know, on the way out. <laughs> yeah, Janacek is not swings and roundabouts, is it? But, but uh... No, and there's comedy to be found as well, often within the silences in Janacek's music. And, and darkness means so much more when it's contrasted against light and vice versa. Oh, absolutely. And it's kind of, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. And, and what about something like, I know you've done Meister Singer before. Now, when I was studying in New York, it was a, uh, they, I did this, this class for a semester <laughs> called Masterworks of Romantic Comic Opera. And, and the operas were Rosen Cavalier, The Barber of Seville, Falstaff, and then, strangely, Meister Singer. Which, for those of you who are listening at home who don't know this, is this, this massive Wagner opera that goes on for hours and hours. And it seems, on the surface, one of the least funny operas out there. Was that your experience of it? Definitely. I mean, I think the funniest thing about My Singer is the fact you don't know it's six hours long and you haven't planned your pee breaks or something. I can imagine that's a nightmare. Uh, Physical comedy. Yeah, yes, absolutely. But what, what's funny, I think, about Meistersinger is the fact that it has it's like a big kind of mirror up to society and the human condition in general and Wagner is poking fun at kind of hierarchy within the Meisters themselves and at music what makes a good musician what makes a good singer and the the bluster and the the ridiculous character of Beckmesser who's also quite you know within the farce is also quite tragic so I think you get so many layers through, through that actual comedy that it's actually very sophisticated and it's never just one thing, which makes it interesting. And yes, I guess makes it a comedy. And you, you just spoke before about Leonard Bernstein, Lenny being one of your Desert Island dinner guests. Yeah. I'm giving you three pieces of culture for lockdown. They can be, it can be a book, a movie, an album, whatever but you can only have three with you. Only three and nothing else in lockdown. What do you choose? Okay, baby. Well, I've done a bit of research because I've been doing lots of reading during this time of lockdown. And I've just read this, My Sister, The Serial Killer, which is great. All about a serial killer and it's kind of black, black humor, quite funny, but I, this is the first novel that this uh, lady's written and it's really good. Another one is Educated, which isn't funny at all. And it's all about, oh. it's, bit of a mole woman situation in America. But if I was gonna actually take some literature, I'd probably take something by Alan Bennett, either a collection of his diaries or maybe some of his talking head scripts, just because that's my kind of humor. And I find something delicious in his observations. And it's important for you then to have something funny with you in this lockdown. Oh, definitely. And Essential. it's interesting. The, yeah, definitely. And I really appreciate, in terms of online content, people that are giving me funny stuff. Yeah, it's so important. Definitely. What about your other two pieces of culture? The other two pieces of culture. Um, I would take, I, well, I'm going to say something controversial in that I would take Ozark on Netflix. Ooh. 
I've and never seen that. It's really good. It's on there at the moment. And it's amazing because you've got Jason Bateman, who's often seen as this kind of comedy character opposite Laura Linney, who's just amazing in everything she does. And she's stunning and gorgeous. So the, the pair of them t- together are fantastic. And Laura Linney's an amazing kind of foil for uh, Jason Bateman. It's a bit like, um, what's it called? All the drugs um, with, 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 what's his name? Breaking Bad. Yeah, that's it, Donnie. Breaking Bad. <laughs> Breaking Bad. It's a bit like that. Slightly kind of more comedy in a way. It's really dry. Dry as an old piece of toast. But a, just a fantastic piece. Oh, beautiful. And the yeah, third piece. Yeah, so there's piece. three series of that. And it, nobody is ever what they seem. And it has all of these kind of twists and turns. So I love that. Yeah. And what about the third piece of culture? Third piece, I'm going to take... Uh, a selection of songs by Victoria Wood. Oh, what a wonderful woman. Yeah, absolutely. I was so So that's a humorous theme through all your pieces of culture, actually. Definitely. I'm not really, I mean, I love, I love classical music, uh, but I think because I do so much of it for a living, I'm not necessarily somebody that's going to sit and listen to, um, you know, do sing along Electra unless my partner makes me do it, which he does. And I do enjoy it but I don't run towards <laughs> classical music in my, in my free time. Although I have been reading lots of books about Janacek because I'm obsessed. Oh, what a wonderful guy. Yeah, definitely. Now, speaking of music, I would love you to add one, uh, add your own contribution to this playlist for humor, this COVID classical playlist. So if you could choose one piece of classical music, what would it be in the vein of humor? I mean, I think it's really hard because there is so much to choose from. It's like choosing between your favourite children or your cats if you're not yet blessed in the womb area. I would say, for me, probably, I mean, he's quite a tragic character as well as being comical. But I think because it's so well done, I'd take some Falstaff. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, especially, you know, the last fugue, which is funny in itself because nobody knows ever when to come in. (laughs) It's one big old joke, isn't it? Oh, definitely. Da, 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 da. Absolutely. So I'd probably, I'd probably take that. I think it's so well written. But there's, there's so much to choose from in terms of, of classical music. And often the actual drama and comedy is within the silences. Of I the think music that's a big the theme, isn't it? The, the drama and the comedy and the silences. And I, I think we're coming to a silence of our own. The end of our chat. It's been great having a drink with you. Speak for yourself, Johnny. I could speak for hours. Do you know what's not funny is the fact that I'm now only, after my first week of drinking gin to try and get over the loss of all my jobs, I'm now only drinking once a week. This is fake beer, but also tasty. I think that's very sensible because I've had a Negroni for the both of us. That's good, Johnny. And may you always do that. Yes, I would love to. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Splendid. It's, it's been a treat from my eyes. The first piece in our playlist for the week is by the great master Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart from his comic opera Don Giovanni. Now it's funny because Don Giovanni was the very last thing that I conducted live with a real orchestra and real singers before all this COVID stuff went down. And it was with Opera Australia at the Sydney Opera House. And it's wonderful, wonderful music. And it's the story of the dissolute rake Don Giovanni who goes around the world, goes around Europe, seducing women, adding them to his catalogue, and he finally gets his comeuppance at the end when a man, a father, he killed during his conquests, the the Commendatore, drags him down to hell. So it doesn't end well for the Don. In any case, this aria is not sung by Don Giovanni, but it's sung by his, his sidekick, his manservant, Leporello. And it's, it's widely known as the catalog aria, Madamina il catalogue questo, which means the uh, little madam, the, ca- the catalog is this. And the catalog aria itself was actually a sort of a genre in 18th century opera where characters listed off certain things. And of course, in this case, in a very unsavory way, it's Leporello listing off Don Giovanni's conquests of women. So, for example, in France, he's got a hundred. Uh, Turkey's got 91, but in Spain, it's already 
1003. And the orchestra comments on this, like it, it, the preposterousness of all of this, but also in a very conspiratorial way, with little dotted rhythms in the strings. In fact, the whole music, the whole song of this aria, starts off with this, 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 this sort of uh, very officious ticking in the strings. Like a very workman, business-like way of making a list. And to add to this, we've got ticking figures in the first violins uh, and the second violins offset with the same figure down lower in the basses and cellos. And so what we called it last week, we called it canonic imitation. But it's just, they say one thing, yup, ba, 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 and then they answer, yup, ba, 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 or whatever way it might go. And this goes on in this first fast section where Leporello lists all of Don Giovanni's conquests. And then the music takes a more lyrical, ballad-like turn. It's in 3-4, three, three equal beats per bar. So he can be a bit more lyrical about saying just what the Don likes. In winter, he likes them fat. In the summer, he likes them skinny. But he doesn't care whether they're tall or short or fat or thin. All he really cares is the punchline and all he cares is that they wear a skirt. And La Gonella, it comes towards the end, the last few, I guess, 30 seconds of the piece. Listen to this really crunchy chord that Mozart puts into the orchestra. It's very unsavory. Unsavory. It's, it's definitely black humour. But it's illuminated by Mozart's genius and wit and can make us smile at the sparkling nature of the way Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart makes drama and opera. <laughs> 